Okay. Millennials? Most millennials? Okay, so this is going to be a mixed bag, right? And who's on the, on the, like the border? No man's land, right? 1997 born. 1997. Yeah, Two, so we guys fall exactly three, the four, center. Five, we don't understand six. both generations. <laughs> exactly at the center. No, but even so, right? Okay, I'm just going to get straight into the conversation. Uh, we know that Gen Zers or Zoomers, as they are called, are perhaps one of the toughest nut to crack. Very elusive. You know, marketers can't get a handle on them. I think a lot of us are just trying to figure out who are Gen Z, what makes them tick. And this discussion is essentially about decoding that. We spoke about a lot of sort of financial content, but we're going to talk about all sorts of content and how, and eventually how marketers are sort of recalibrating that, how brands are recalibrating their content strategies to better target Gen Zers. And I think I'm going to come to Harshil first who is a millennial. Right, Harshal, you of course work with a lot of brands, you work with a lot of creators, influencers. Uh, tell me, who truly powers influence, who has influence over um, Gen Z today? Because I read a very interesting stat, uh, a study by Yuva, that said 50% are not actually influenced by influencers or celebrity endorsers, but in fact they're friends. Just to start there, but give me your view on what yeah. truly influenced I think it's a mixed bag, you know, because uh, there was a phase where people were very influenced by influencers, but now influencers are now becoming a media channel more and more. Uh, so, you know, there are, there's two, part, two things happening in the brand world. One is that there are the, you know, the influencers who now I classify as celebrities. So they're like too high up, they negotiate, they have their own terms, so they will promote the way they want to promote. That's one. And I think that's where it's working. Then the second is influencers who almost become like media outlets, spokesperson outlets, saying brand will say, say this, and just parrot that, and brands are now starting to see it as a media paradigm. So I think that's where it's sitting today, and that's where the challenge lies. Right, right. So from millennial to a Gen Zer now, and Ayush, maybe I'll come to you first. We just heard, of course, Sharan, you know, again, a Gen Zer, and he was talking about how important it is, essentially, to make your content relatable. That's the bottom line, authentic, yeah. you know. So what's, what are you seeing when you talk? You're a Gen Zer. Tell us what you really think. Um, I mean... I was in a panel session a couple of weeks ago as well and the topic again there was Gen Z and they were asking me how to crack Gen Z and uh, you know one concept which I follow uh, when it comes to my own generation Gen Z is this con concept called PRI, it's like purpose, recognition and impact. Like if you're thinking about Gen Z always think, like we as Gen Z's think like what is the purpose, what is the, what, how am I getting recognized and what is the impact I'm creating, why am I doing what I'm doing how is it impacting other people and how am I get, what am I getting out of it? These are the three things. Like for example, uh, if I think about my employer, if he's a Gen Z employer, I'll think these three things. If I give him a work and give him recognition, he'll say that this is impact is being driven by He will be very motivated as compared to just telling him that he will task. Hai if he doesn't know what he's doing, why is he doing, he won't be motivated. And that you can apply Listen. in buying decisions ev everywhere. That's what I follow personally. Mm -hmm. And that applies to, like you said, of course, shopping habits, buying decisions, how they pick and choose the brands yeah. that they use. I want to come to you, Rohit, next. Of course, you were, uh, you've been a huge force behind one of the OG influencers. And again, someone who sort of transcended into a celebrity world. You built an entire business around him, Bhuvam. Um, tell me, you know, especially when you were trying to sort of crack that code, uh, what are some of the principles that you used? So I frankly, I mean, before Bhuvan, there was nobody uh, who was doing independent content creation, right? So uh, naturally, when I was one of the first talent managers representing a digital creator and speaking to brands for any kind of integration, and this was back in 2015, 16. Um, why? So I, I spoke to Bhuvan. I sat with him for a good six months. We used to travel together. We never did brand deals. We used to travel together, spend time together, and try the understanding why and how he was able to get those million subscribers in the beginning of his you know, journey. And I realized that I have to be super transparent with how my creator feels about whatever he is creating. Because uh, the brand would come to me only because they want to associate with Bhuvan for his content that he's been doing for the past so many months or so many years. Uh, so when they come to me and they're having a conversation with me, 
uh, they need to believe in the process of content creation that Bhuvan has been following. So in the first brand, brand deal itself, he said, I will never say go buy this brand towards the end of the video. So there will never be an end slate, right? He said, I, I've never said go brand subscribe to my don't channel. Like that. They don't like it, but uh, I feel I give them good numbers to associate with me with the kind of terms that I have. And I think saying no was the first learning that I had for the first two years. Of course, when you see a lot of money coming your way, uh, you tend to become, I mean, your decisions are a little dicey. But then if you're sure that, okay, money is not why we are doing this, you are here to make an impact, and a no will really help me six months down the line, uh, I think uh, that's how we paved our journey in the whole content creation into brand integration world. Uh, and today I have my own terms. It's, it's like one pager which I explain to somebody within a minute. If they, if they understand it, great. If they don't, then maybe somebody else will do it for them. You need short form content even there, right? When you're talking to marketers. But Zeal, I'll come to you next because what happens very often when we talk about cohorts like Gen Z or Millennial, we typically think of a very urban audience, right? And it's very perhaps Bombay, Delhi, Bangalore, that sort of thing. Now, of course, you are a creator working out of Surat. You know, you have content that is perhaps very, not your typical Gen Z content consumed online, whether it's fashion, beauty, now finance, of course. Uh, so, so tell me a little bit about the insights that drive your content strategy and how are you seeing perhaps interest from brands, marketers coming to you? Okay. So what I personally think is that uh, now there is not just a gap of Gen Z and the adult we have now other group which is pre-lockdown and post-lockdown. The way they used to consume content before lockdown, it was different. But now the way Gen Z consume the content is different. How now, is it different? Now you can't fool them, right? You could fool them earlier, is it? Yeah, because they used to watch what they want. If you see tech influencers, right? Uh, people used to subscribe them, people used to follow them. And if they put anything like iPhone uh, 13, if it is not into their budget, but still they will watch the whole video and maybe they will try to buy that, right? But right now, if you see tech influencers, they are going down because people only go and search what they want, right? No matter you say that this is the era of suggested content, right? Sorts, reels, but in that suggested content also, the algorithm which is putting out the content in front of you, but people will not still watch that content, no matter algorithm puts that in front of you. You need to hook that audience, right? No matter it is suggested content, but you have to hook that audience. So I being a spiritual content creator, uh, I started in lockdown, right? Um, I guess I was at 10,000 followers and I started filling the bridge between science and spirituality. And within just two months, my first video itself, it went 18 million views, right? And from there, I grew to from 10,000 to 2 million. So I think that now people want experience. You can't just directly target them with brand. You can't just integrate any brand into your video and you will uh, like influence them to go and buy that. You have to target with your experience and that experience has to be with that brand. So that's what I think and that's how I started uh, creating content and that's how I guess I and other influencers should deal with uh, brands. And that's really interesting because what you're saying is algorithms perhaps don't have that kind of persuasive power on viewers as much as it used to have. And secondly, you saw a shift in the kind of content people want to consume, in your case, spiritual content. Rohit, I know you want to say something, but let me just quickly get to Ganesh first because, again, Ganesh, you create content that is, again, not in those typical buckets that we've always seen, which, are pop which is popular. Um, so, again, same question that I posed to Zelia. Um, how did you see your growth, especially with the kind of content that you do? So, if you look at Think School's growth, we make content on business case studies and geopolitics. So, I don't see Think School as a YouTube channel, I see it as a business school on the internet. And the primary goal of Think School was just one thing that is to put a dent in the Indian education system. So, our purpose was very, very clear. And we said, that we will not put out content just for the sake of infotainment. We will put out content for that B-School kid 
who is not able to understand what his professor is saying, mm -hmm. but will be able to understand concepts through our YouTube videos, which is why you will see a lot of charts, explanations. In fact, our explanations go so deep that yesterday there was a LinkedIn post that was put out by one of our subscribers where, we ha where he had an entire notebook filled with notes that he made from a Think School video. And you can also see in the comments that people are saying, oh, this is the Southwest Airlines case study. I watched it and I also made similar notes. So for me, Think School is not a YouTube channel. It's a B-School on the internet. And I am not a content creator. My competition are the professors at IIM. <laughs> and fortunately, we've been able to do it so well that now professors at IIM use Think School's video as study materials. Mm -hmm. So when we made a video on Tata Motors and how they exploded and how they penetrated the Indian market, a professor from IIM Bangalore played it on the slideshow to explain it to the students. Mm -hmm. So that is how Think School grew by not positioning itself as an infotainment channel, but as a B-School on the internet. So if you look at our growth because of the value that we provided, first of all, I never expected this value. I never expected this kind of growth. We went from 3,000 subscribers to 100,000 subscribers in 10 days after the first video exploded. Then we started hitting 100,000 subscribers every month to hit 1 million in 11 months. And then the Russia-Ukraine war happened, so we said, okay, let's bring in the geopolitical and economic angle to it, to business. So we went from 1 million to 2 million in 6 months, and we went from 2 million to 3 million in another 6 months. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of the value. So it's as simple as that. And if you look at our YouTube videos, almost all of our YouTube videos are sponsored. So until now, we must have posted 246 YouTube videos, out of which 196 videos are sponsored. Mm -hmm. But, and Harshil was just asking me, what is the hack? Why don't the Think School subscribers hate the fact that we put out sponsored segment in every single video? That is because in a 20-minute video, a one-minute integration is merely 5% of the time consumed by the viewer in watching the ad and 95% of the time is spent into just extracting that enormous amount of value. Mm -hmm. So if you give them that much value and take one minute of theirs they and put out sponsored it. content, yeah. they understand that to provide so much value, it requires efforts, and it requires efforts of many other people. For that, you need to pay salaries. As a result, that one minute is mm -hmm. quite justified. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And again, uh, back to Ayush's point about purpose, because you found that's your purpose, right? You are not perhaps, I mean, the money is good, I'm sure. The sponsored posts and the videos are great. But uh, Ayush, give me a second. Harshil, um, where did that question come from to Ganesh? Because, uh, firstly, I just want to make a small segue. It's like cool, so cool that I'm watching the guy whose YouTube videos I watch. He sounds exactly the same. He emotes exactly the same. Authenticity, right? Authenticity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. authenticity, exactly. Mm -hmm. and I love the point about purpose. So the question came from the fact that I think that a, because I've seen a lot of Think School videos with all of them having a lot of integration, so that was one, A is like, how are you always so full? Uh, and how is your community not pushing back? Uh, because sometimes what we see with there creators is, is that yeah. when, when you do yeah. the insertions, the community starts to push back. So that's where the question came from. But in terms of, uh, again, I'm, I'm asking you to sort of, you know, put on your agency head, uh, agency hat. Um, how are you seeing perhaps some of these brands who are coming on board to, you know, with, with any, of, any of the folks here, how are you seeing their view of the content and therefore then targeting Gen Z change? I think that, you know, the brands are also sensing that there is the need for this authenticity. So, uh, and that is why, you know, we were commenting that there is some kind of flatlining happening on influencer spends. Two reasons. Uh, flatlining happening on influencer spends because at the top of the spectrum, you can have the brand integrate with an uh, influencer message, which is a bit more authentic. So, I, I mean, I give you an example. Ranveer has now got a sponsor for the podcast, Mountain Dude, Dar Ke Aage Jeet Hai. And the podcast is only talking about the stories of bravery. And, and therefore, then there's a segment for four weeks on the podcast, which is only talking about bravery. Now, that is a bit more authentic, and he's bringing in the guests, he's curating it that way. Now, where the challenge comes in, why the f spends are flatlining, and I, I, I was in this morning in a meeting with uh, one of the OTT players. He gave me an example that last year, this time, they spent an influencer campaign, 1,700 influencers. Mm -hmm. This year, this time, they've done another campaign, only three macro influencers. 
So what's happening is that now brands have to start getting picky and choosy and integrate into this authentic message in a good way. It's also more expensive. It's got tough terms. He says, I won't do this, I won't do that. Say no. Say no. So that is the landscape that we are now entering. So the middle and the bottom is now starting to struggle. Yeah. Because also it's inauthentic, so the follow growth is not really happening. The breakouts are not happening. So I think that's what's getting challenging about the space. It's changing quite dramatically. Ayush, also, if you can perhaps tell us even, you know, uh, the platforms, the recalibration there. We spoke, we heard from, you know, we talked about YouTube, of course, uh, there's Snapchat and there's IG and all of that. But when it comes to Gen Zers, um, and, you know, you do a lot of finance content as well, uh, where are they watching it now? You know, have, have you seen shifts, a, a cohort shift from one platform to another? What's more powerful, what's more important to them? Is it YouTube or is it Instagram? What is it? I mean, millennials, we know Facebook, right? Or even <laughs> that's not happening now, but... Uh. Um, I mean, I don't think Gen Z's have a priority. It depends upon what kind of content I'm watching. It's depending on the content rather than the person. For example, if I want to get educated about fi uh, fashion or travel or lifestyle, I will idly go to Instagram. If I want to dress up for an event, I will search my favorite influencer and I'll see his reels and I'll see his get ready with me real and then I'll try to replicate that. But if I want to understand uh, a geopolitics scenario or a business case study or learn something about personal science, I'll go some to someone like a think school. Right? That, that is on YouTube and not on Instagram. So it depends upon the type of content we're talking about and not the person. I personally consume YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn and even X for, uh, for, the, for that matter. X I go for news. LinkedIn I go to understand what's happening in my industry in terms of marketing, what they're talking about. Uh, Instagram, I grew to understand the influencer industry, fashion, mein kya chal hai, uh, tech, mein kya chal hai, uh, finance, maybe a segment of Instagram. Hai. Like a lot of infotainment creators that we manage at Finet are on Instagram. They are Instagram first creators. So I can't like pinpoint ki Instagram is powerful, hai, ki YouTube is powerful. Hai. But generally speaking, if you are a lifestyle fashion brand, Instagram works better for you. And if you are an infotainment brand, YouTube will work better for you in the long run because it has more depth. So honestly, just a very customized kind of approach to what you consume, where you consume. Rohit, you wanted to say something earlier, perhaps, on what, what you... I mean, no, not really. But then uh, <laughs> what these guys said is, is uh, all correct. Because, like he said, that you need to be... The audiences have become really smart post-COVID, right? They know uh, where that ad segment is going to come, right? They know when to skip. They know when to... Uh, this is talking just about Gen Zers, or do you see that happening even in other cohorts? It's with everybody. I think it's, it's the same with my mom as well. Because uh, <laughs> yeah. if you're consuming content one hour a day, then you will be habitual of the same thing. I think uh, just the genre or the kind of people that they'd be following would be a little different. But the information comes from, the, I mean, it'll, the same information comes to me three days later. Mm -hmm. But it comes from almost all walks of people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, uh, your, content, your brand integration, in, in at least in our case, is like a sandwich, right? Like a burger, like a patty. So my brand is the patty and uh, the content is right around it. You don't have either alone, mm -hmm. right? So if, if you want to consume the patty, if you want to consume the brand, you need to sandwich it between good content, good humor, good, in, good entertainment, so that the, the, the people can, you know, really flow through it and consume it in the way. Like I can't, aff I make a five minute video and Boon makes a five minute video on his channel. I can't afford people skipping even 30 seconds. So my integrations would not be more than 22 seconds, which a brand really gets shocked with, you know, because how can you do that? But uh, I say that, listen, I'll tell four things, very crystal clear. I will give that message out, but I will sandwich it between some entertainment scenes, so that uh, entertaining scenes, so that people don't feel, uh, you know, that I've take them, taken them for a ride when I'm showing them a video one month later. Right. Uh, and I also am I'm, I'm able to entertain them after I've given them a brand segment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, let me just quickly come to you because this is again something that uh, I think both Ganesh and Ayush mentioned, which is purpose. Uh, we know studies have told us that Gen Zers are uh, more conscious consumers. Uh, maybe, you know, you saw that sort of bump in your viewership and the kind of sort of response you got to your content uh, because of perhaps a more purpose, purposeful approach to consumption. Um, do you think that's true or is that a, perhaps a bit of an exaggeration that, you know, Gen Zers are far more conscious consumers than, say, the pre previous generations? See, consciousness is evolving, right? As being a spiritual influencer, 
I know what consciousness really means. Now Instagram is like a showroom and YouTube is like a classroom. So uh, if you want to sell something or if you want to influence something, right in a showroom if uh, the good uh, dress or good bikes are in the front row, if someone is passing through that road, they will be intrigued. The emotion, the, we, you can capture their emotions directly uh, showing them something. But if you uh, come to YouTube, now YouTube is like a classroom. People will uh, go into the, the depth of that content. People will uh, actually uh, invest their time. If you see in classes, in colleges, uh, when maths teacher is teaching something and people are scrolling Instagram uh, below the bench. At Maybe they're watching our videos, you never know, right? <laughs> <laughs> at that point of time, they will not listen to what you are speaking in the video. They will read the captions of, or maybe they will just crawl through your reel. If something can capture them, it will go directly to their emotions, their consciousness, right? right? So that's what I think like youth and Gen Z's are right now uh, like a Rubik, Rubik's Cube, right? They are distracted, uh, they love challenges, but they are also like a litmus paper, if people know in chemistry. Uh, if you put a drop and the litmus paper uh, change the color, Similarly, if the influencer or brand or anyone on internet, if they change their color, Gen Z's are gonna kick you out. <laughs> so that's how their consciousness is evolving. And that's where I conclude myself, that people are now more smarter than before. They know what to consume. Absolutely, absolutely. Harshal, uh, just quick take and I want to just quickly then open it up to the audience and you know just maybe take a few, maybe one question from anyone in the audience so you have like two minutes to think about it. But just quickly about this point about uh, conscious consumerism, are Gen Zers rejecting some of the brands, products, services perhaps that previous generations like millennials very sort of openly used, endorsed? Uh, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think you know, I think there's a bit of, uh, we're still at, while with content, they're a lot more conscious. With brands, with eyewash, they're okay. So I think, I think that's where I would put it. Uh, and I think also with respect to brands and influencers, uh, Gen Z is, uh, I think, definitely very unforgiving if the wrong brand comes with the wrong influencer. So I can give two examples. You know, I work too closely with two influencers. Masum is my partner. And I can know that when she does something to support Indian designers, something to do with fashion, she has brands which partner with her with sell out. So the amount of money that they spend, they kind of recover that money. So that works and her audience also enjoys it. The integration is seamless. Tomorrow if she spoke about a finance brand, there would be zero ROI. So that is where I think the uh, fit is yesterday and Ranveer and I run a meditation app together. So he put out a video yesterday for one hour. We kept the video on and we pulled it back 40,000 downloads in one hour. So, you know, that is the kind of power where, because we call his, we call his audience. And we asked them, what do you want to learn from him? 50% of them said, I want to learn meditation. So, uh, you know, that is... Listening. I think, yeah. Listening. Yeah. Thinking together is, is very important. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, is Sharon still here? I mean, when you said Masoom doing finance content, that was... That He's was not here. He left. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, are there any questions from any Gen, Gen Zers or Millennials, from any one of our creators or Millennials on the panel? But, uh, sorry. Go on, Aish. No, I was just asking my friend to ask question. <laughs> Who is that? Vijay, Vijay. Vijay, are you here? Yeah, there is. Yeah, do you, do you have one? Do you have one for Aish? Can we quickly maybe, or can you just maybe just come up or? Oh, there you go, Mike, yeah. Can't hear you, bro. Up, Ajo, here, Ajo, no? In the, in, in the spirit of authenticity, let's, let's get an authentic question. So I have a question from Rohit. Uh, so there are uh, many creators in the market. Har din koi na koi ek naya creator aata hai. But you are working with Bhuvan, right? Or itne saal se kar aap. So what do you think, yaar, ki, uh, what makes him unique? Or a strong personal brand, kaise build kiya usne, jo usko bohat alag leke chale jata hai? Give us, give us the nutshell, Rohit. I mean, uh, so with Bhuvan, if you would see his interviews, he's, he's very real. When you will meet him in person, you would see that he's, he's very authentic. Uh, the kind of content he makes, uh, 
uh, on BBK wines, and he still does, uh, is is something that will happen in everybody's household. To, even today, my mom tells me, "Ki raat ko pani ki bottle bhake, fir sona." Huh? So I believe the kind of content that he has made, the kind of relationship that he has formed with his audiences, the kind of uh, punts that he has played. Like in 2018, we produced our first short film and eventually won a film fair for it. Uh, then one day he came up to me and he said, at 4 a.m. in between the two lockdown waves, he called me and he said, I think we should make a show out of BBK Wines and call it Dindora. And that came out, did 600 million views. I think we've, we've been playing on his gut feeling, on his intuition. Uh, he has a lot of conviction in what he does. Uh, so he does, just does in whatever work he's been doing, if you know. Uh, he writes his own content, he acts in it, he edits it, he puts the music on it. He also publicizes it himself, right? And he, he's playing all the characters in it. So the kind of conviction that he puts in every video, even today in the morning we were having a chat that we're coming up with a show tomorrow, it's called Takeshi's Castle, it's coming out on Prime Video. And I said, uh, while we are coming up with a show on Prime Video, why don't we put out one BBK Wines video on our channel and talk about the show on the, in the video and make it more popular, right? And let that message reach out to our audiences at least. He said, listen, I've written it. It's almost there. I still need seven more days to better it. Only then I want to go and shoot it. So he, till the time he's not very sure about what he's doing, he doesn't take it up. Uh, there have been multiple venues where we've received, uh, you know, invites for Bhuvan to act as a secondary actor in films and big films, and I'm like really big films, and he said no, because he feels this is not something that I would want to take up right now. He's, he likes to take things slow, uh, have that authenticity in place every time, and be very real to his audience. I think that's, how, that's what he's been doing, plus a little bit of innovation where you are a little sure of what you're doing. Authenticity, right, at the end of the day. And you well, know, what I think is that Bhuvan has achieved that level of I don't know whether to call it supremacy or authenticity, that he's this guy that you all root, that he wins. Mm. I still yeah. remember when I was in my third year of engineering, we were watching Bhuvan and um, all of our friends, we were just sitting together and we were thinking, dude, he's putting in so much of efforts, we just hope that this guy blows up. And I still remember when Dindora came out and I put out a tweet, all my friends said, if Bhuvan is coming out with Dindora, we will support him. And they have no connection to Bhuvan whatsoever. And yet, they would root for him and they would say, if Bhuvan is coming out with this, he must be doing it on YouTube because maybe somebody rejected him. We will support him and we will turn him into a big star. Similarly, when um, uh, Taza Khabar came out, I still remember that uh, first ad when he just, uh, I think he took out the newspaper. It was a teaser, I guess. And then he kept it down. You should read the comments. It says, Bhuvan bhai, aap to fod doge. One by rocket. You turn consumers into cheerleaders. Exactly. And yeah, everybody yeah. knows Bhuvan's story. He's this guy in college who's extremely ambitious, wants to do something really crazy, and in a big, bad, crowded, competitive world. And we know for sure that he is excellent because of the work that he has done so consistently. Which is why True. Bhuvan is this guy whom you root for. <coughs> and when 30 million people root for you, if that says something. Authenticity and consistency, I, I absolutely agree with that. But I'm afraid that's all the time that we have for this session. There is, of course, so much more to explore. And we'll, we'll take this offline somewhere. But thank you so much for joining us, thank everyone. So and I hope, I hope we can take away a lot from this one. Thank you. Thank you. That was indeed a quality conversation. Thank you, panelists.